Freedom is coming. Freedom is coming. Freedom is coming. Oh yes, I know. Freedom is coming. Freedom is coming. Freedom is coming. Oh yes, I know. Oh yes, I know. Teach my heart to 
Lord is speaking when we speak. Our words become His word. And in the speech of every day, eternal things are heard. If God is building when we build, we call each one our own. The Lord for us to praise ourselves, our praise is God. Good morning and welcome to our service from Grange Methodist Mance. Here we are. Uh, what is it, week 51? I think so. <laughs> um, just a reminder, uh, later in the service, uh, when uh, if you're creating your own sort of Lent focus, um, prayer, whatever we call it, I don't know, prayer display, <laughs> um, this week uh, the item to add is a stone. I have a a very large stone here, but you may have a smaller one. Um, and yes, um, to those who said uh, in the comments, oh, I'm not sure how I'm going to hang a stone on our tree. Um, yeah, they're not all things to hang, I'm afraid. I'm sorry if you'd planned that, it's not going to work quite like that. Next week, you need a candle. Let's begin with a prayer. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, May the light of your presence set our hearts on fire with love for you. Amen. Amen. Our first song this morning is God, You're Good to Me. Um, I'm waiting for some people over there to move. I'm here. <laughs> They'll join in.
going to use prayers from the worship book uh, for this morning. Um, So let us pray. Eternal God and Father, you are the source of all life, the fount of all wisdom, the wellspring of all grace. Your days are without end, your loving mercies without number. We depend on you. And we remember your goodness to us and to those who have gone before us. We tell your story in every generation. God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. God of Sarah, Rebecca and Rachel. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God of a pilgrim people, your church. You are our God. Ahead of us, leading us, guiding us and calling us. You are the Lord God, the all-wise, the all-compassionate. To you we lift up our hearts and we worship you, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. We've been remembering that story of, uh, of God and God's work with God's people through uh, past weeks. Today's Old Testament reading, um, we've been following covenants, but today's Old Testament reading doesn't use the word covenant within the part that we hear, but it is called a covenant. It's a little bit different, though, from the other two so far, because it's a conditional covenant, or we might say a bilateral covenant, that requires some commitment on both sides. When God made the covenant with Noah, there was nothing that Noah was asked to do on his part to belong to be a part of that covenant. God just made a promise to Noah and his family and to all living creatures. When God made the promise to Abraham and Sarah that he would give them many descendants, again, God didn't ask anything of them. But today, we hear how God gave the people a set of rules to follow, the Ten Commandments, we call them. Just in the previous chapter, when God is explaining to Moses what he's going to do, God says to Moses, You saw what I, the Lord, did to the Egyptians and how I carried you as an eagle carries her young on her wings and brought you here to me. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. So today's reading is a serious call to commitment. God is showing the people some basic principles for how to live well. Thank you to Pam for reading for us today. Reading from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, 
nor your manservant or your maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. Amen. In the communion liturgy uh, that's specially for the season of Lent, we hear the commandments read and follow them with a prayer of confession. So we're going to pray together now using those words. Let's pray. Join in with the bold yellow type. Lord, you are steadfast in your love and infinite in your mercy. You welcome sinners and invite them to be your guests. We confess our sins, trusting in you to forgive us. We have yielded to temptation and sinned. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have turned from our neighbours in their need. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. We have resisted your word in our hearts. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and keep us in life eternal. Amen. Amen. And so we have... A rainbow to remind us of the covenant God made with Noah, hope for all the world and a promise that God will not break. A star to remind us of God's covenant with Abraham and Sarah, a promise that through their many descendants all the earth would be blessed. And a stone to remind us of the Ten Commandments, God's call to people to make the covenant relationship their way of life. And so we sing, it's number 463, if you're using the hymn books, Deep in the Shadows of the Past.
Our Gospel reading comes from near the beginning of John's Gospel. Uh, we've been using Mark for the last few weeks, but now the lectionary brings us into John's Gospel. And this story is told in all four Gospels, which is quite unusual. There aren't many stories that are in each of the Gospels. But the other three all have it very near the end. After Jesus' public arrival in Jerusalem, for the final time before his crucifixion, it's marking the beginning of the end, if you like. But in John, this story is told at the beginning. It's part of setting out Jesus' identity and purpose as his ministry begins. Part of the nature of the Gospels um, is that they're not history or biography as we would understand it today. They are a theology. They are setting out um, and arranging the stories with a purpose to help us to understand and believe and to know and meet Jesus for ourselves. It's not, they're not always easy to understand, though. Today, as you listen to this story, I just ask you to pay attention to how it makes you feel. You might feel excited or troubled or uncomfortable. If you're watching on Facebook and you can use the chat, you might want to type in um, a word to say how this story makes you feel. It's John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, and Phil is reading for us. Thank you. Reading from John 2, verses 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover... Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here! How dare you turn my father's house into a market! His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The 
The Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So we're continuing to follow the God for all themes uh, from that ecumenical vision and today is speak boldly and really at first glance this is absolutely the perfect passage to think about speaking boldly, speaking and even more acting boldly. I wonder how you were feeling as you heard that, are you cheering Jesus on? Or maybe you feel it's all a bit embarrassing, really, a bit like Jesus is losing his rag, having a bit of a temper tantrum in the temple. Maybe you're looking back at that small print that we talked about last week to see if there's anything mentioned about this sort of behaviour in the terms and conditions you thought you'd signed up to. After all, nice Christians surely aren't supposed to get angry. This is not the sort of Jesus that perhaps we thought we were following. Speak boldly is this week's theme, but then we might want to pause a moment and read the blurb about it in that ecumenical vision to see how it's understood. It says there, we will share our faith in Jesus Christ in everyday ways, seeking to connect with everyone, especially those underrepresented or unrepresented in our churches. I'll read that again. We will share our faith in Jesus Christ in everyday ways, seeking to connect with everyone, especially those unrepresented in our churches. Well, hmm, that maybe doesn't fit so well after all with Jesus in the temple turning the tables over. Speaking boldly is about sharing our faith. So how can rampaging around the temple with a whip be a blueprint, if you like, for our mission and evangelism? How does it help us to think through those things? Well, actually, it might not be so far out as it might sound at first. There are various theories about why Jesus was causing such an uproar in the temple. Firstly, the temple trading system was probably ripping people off. The animals brought for sacrifice needed to be unblemished. That was part of the expectation and the requirement. If you brought your own lamb, but then the priests looked at it and said it wasn't good enough, then you'd have to buy one of theirs and you'd be a captive market. If you'd come to pay your temple tax, then you needed to change your Roman denarii for the shekels that were the legal currency in the temple. And who set the exchange rate? There were real issues of justice here. But the other part of well, the other theory about perhaps why Jesus was did what he did was that this marketplace was set up in the temple courts. And now sometimes we talk about whether it's right and appropriate for churches today to have shops in them based on, on this reading, you know, gift shops in cathedrals and things like that. But the point was that this market was specifically in the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. If you weren't a Jew, this was the only part of the temple open to you, where you could come and pray and worship God. And yet, arriving, you would find that it was full of stalls and traders and didn't feel like a place for prayer at all. So let's just hear that God for all speak boldly vision again. We will share our faith in Jesus Christ in everyday ways, seeking to connect with everyone, especially those unrepresented in our churches. Perhaps in turning the tables over in the temple, Jesus is saying something about sharing faith. Perhaps he's telling the authorities that they've got their priorities wrong that they've lost sight of the purpose of the temple, 
which is not to create a little holy huddle, but to share and welcome all. It's not about running a perfect system of perfect animal sacrifices. It never was. The sacrifices were always pointing to something more, pointing to a God who wants to be in relationship with us, and not just a chosen few. This is the God who made a covenant with Noah and with all living creatures. So Jesus crashes into the middle of this system and all of those participating in it. Maybe some were participating with honest, God-seeking spirituality. I'm sure they were. There were probably others just unthinkingly going along with what's expected. And yes, there probably were some using the system for their own benefit and others turning a blind eye to the corruption there. So Jesus crashes into the middle of it and shouts, come on, wake up. What do you think this is all about? And his disciples, seeing what he did, remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. We often talk about consumerism, about what we consume, and there are plenty of sermons that could be preached about that. But today, I wonder what consumes us. What does faith compel us to do? What consumes you? What, if anything, makes you feel like making a whip or shouting in the streets? What makes your blood boil? What makes you weep tears of frustration and anger? Is there anything? And what do you do about it? I'm not saying that turning over tables is the only way to go. In some situations, there are much more productive ways to seek change and to work for it. But this story and what Jesus does reminds us that actually turning over tables is an option when necessary. Coming at this from a slightly different angle, I do think that maybe speaking and acting on the matters that are important to us, the matters that consume us, is actually a form of mission. Too often, I think, people see the church, well, their impression at least, is that the church is sitting around complaining that things aren't what they used to be, maybe that young people these days don't have any respect, maybe condemning other people's sexual morality, claiming to be suffering from discrimination against the church, while itself institutionally discriminating against women and ethnic minorities and LGBT people and, well, we could continue the list. These things don't speak of the good news of God. And I suspect that there are a few tables in today's church that Jesus would really quite like to turn over. Just imagine instead if people could see Christians speaking out against injustice, taking action, fighting poverty and cruelty and discrimination and the destruction of creation. We do already do these things in all sorts of ways. That's not to say that we couldn't do them more. But I think it's time for the church to wake up, to stand up and to act with greater boldness because Speaking prophetically is sharing our faith. Evangelism isn't just sitting with someone and helping them to know that Jesus loves them and offers, offers them freedom from sin, though being ready to do that at the right moment is important. Ev evangelism is also about showing people that they too can bring the passions that consume them and even their anger and Together, we can find that when we work for justice, Jesus is among us. If we're making a difference, then just maybe people might want to know this God who we believe calls us to make a difference. As I've been thinking about this passage this week, I've wondered what happened the day afterwards? Did Jesus' outburst change anything? Did it get rid of the traders in the temple or were they back at their stalls the next day, business as usual? Did Jesus manage to change the system? 
I don't know. And I don't know whether there's any um, kind of historical records that might help us know anything about that. But I suspect that actually the next day was business as usual. Human nature is what it is. But perhaps Jesus changed a few minds that day. Perhaps he did wake some people up. Perhaps he got them asking questions they hadn't thought about before. Maybe some there recognised that the word of God was standing in their midst. Actually, we know that some did recognise the word of God standing there in their midst. Those disciples remembered what scripture said, zeal for your house will consume me. And after the resurrection, they could finally begin to see what Jesus meant when he said he would rebuild this temple in three days. All of this only really makes sense in the light of the resurrection. But eventually, they would understand that God will never be contained in our buildings. The true temple is Jesus' body. And actually, we are that body. We are called to follow Jesus and to participate in all that he was doing and all that Jesus still is doing, sharing that good news that God is for all, challenging injustice, speaking boldly and acting boldly, so that all might know that the word of God is still in our midst today. So let's pray the God for all prayer. Living Lord, as we offer to you our common life, refresh our vision that we may know your will and seek to follow in all your ways. May we follow daily as your disciples, care deeply for one another in community, speak boldly your gospel words of love, and tread gently as faithful stewards of your goodness. We ask this in the power of your holy name, as creator, redeemer and sustainer of our lives, today and forever. Amen. We're going to sing again. Jesus Christ is waiting, waiting in the streets. It's number 251, if you're using the book.
Oh, I'm just being shown a comment. <laughs> Can't read a comment and speak at the same time. It's interesting that the people in the temple didn't argue that what they were doing was correct. They asked him by what authority he was acting to stop them doing what they had always done. Yes, absolutely. And it's really, um, it's interesting if you dig back into some of the allusions of, of the Bible passages um, that are in that story. Um, there's a uh, I think I can't remember where it is now, but there's a there's a, a thing that says when when um, you know this this will happen when when the Lord comes when the Lord stands in our midst and and there he was um, I, I think uh, yeah I'd have to look that up and work out maybe I'll post something on the uh, on the Facebook comments um, when I've looked it up later. Thank you. For our prayers of intercession today, we've uh, we've got a response. When I say give us yeah, when I say give us compassion, I invite you to respond with the words help us challenge injustice. Give us compassion. Help, help us challenge injustice. injustice. And so we bring our prayers to God for all that is on our minds and hearts today. We pray today for people and nations suffering conflict. Conflict over land or freedoms or simply the right to life. We pray particularly for the Ouija people of China, for Myanmar and for Yemen. We remember Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe today the end of her five years sentence. We pray for all who are forced from their homes in search of safety and the basic necessities of life. Give us compassion. Help, Help us, us challenge, challenge injustice. injustice. We pray for all who experience discrimination and exclusion and for those who promote and maintain these systems and behaviours. We pray for all in this country and throughout the world whose working conditions are unsafe or whose pay is less than they need and deserve. Help us to recognise when our own behaviour is contributing to the demands on them and make us determined to bring change. Give us compassion. Help, Help us challenge, challenge injustice. injustice. God, we thank you for all who are involved in the vaccination programmes here and around the world. We thank you for the amazing work of scientists and medics and all in supporting roles who have enabled this to happen. And we pray for those countries without the infrastructure and the resources to vaccinate their populations and for the aid organisations working to bring the vaccine to them. Give us compassion. Help, Help us, us challenge, challenge injustice. injustice. We pray today for all who are sick and those who care for them. We pray for those working in hospitals and at the end of their strength feeling exhausted and we pray that as those numbers of people in hospital fall, that they might find space and time for rest and recovery. May those who are ill and those who care 
be valued not just for what they can do, but for who they are. In the quietness, we remember those known to us who are sick at home or in hospital and those who support and treat them. Give us compassion. Help Help us us challenge challenge injustice. We pray today for teachers and young people and their families preparing to return to school this week. For all others who are um, associated with the work in schools. We pray for the complicated mix of feelings about all of this, for eagerness to see one another again, and anxiety and fear about the virus and missed work and exam results. We pray especially for those who were already disadvantaged by the situations of their lives and their life experience. And we pray that the inequalities that have been more clearly revealed by the pandemic might be addressed. Give us compassion. Help Help us us challenge challenge injustice. And we pray for churches and other faith groups seeking to discern how and when to gather again. We pray for the Grange Church Council meeting this Tuesday and for others around the circuit and our own churches, wherever we may be. Perhaps we hope our tables need not be overturned any further. But we ask you to reshape our life and work, not to serve ourselves, but to connect with everyone so that all might know your love. Give us compassion. Help Help us challenge challenge injustice. And so we join in the prayer that Jesus taught his friends. Our Our Father Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your Your kingdom kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we sing our final hymn, Sent by the Lord Am I, number 239. Kingdom comes. 
And so let's pray. Loving God, send us out to work for justice and hope, to share your good news and reach all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Have a good week. I will speak out for those who have no voices. I will stand up for the rights of all the oppressed. I will speak truth and justice. I will defend the poor and the needy. I will lift up the weak in Jesus' name. Jesus' name.